Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching Big Picture and I'm Vishal Dahiya. Today, we're going to talk about a landmark policy initiative, that is the National Science, Technology and Innovation Policy Draft, which has been put in public domain by the Department of Science and Technology. Now, it is considered to be one of the most significant uh, events amidst many important changes in the past decade that have uh, necessitated the formulation of a new outlook and strategy for science, technology and innovation. So we'll try and understand what are the key focus areas as far as this draft policy is concerned and what necessitated those changes which based on which this policy has been brought in public domain. And for more on this, uh, we joined by a distinguished panel of guests, those who have been closely involved with this particular policy and these areas as well. Let me first introduce them to you, beginning with Professor Ashutosh Sharma is with us as Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology with the Government of India, the department which has put this public policy, this policy in public domain. We also have with us Professor V. Ramagopal Rao, he is the Director of Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, and uh, Dr. Ram Vishwakarma, advisor with the CSIR. Welcome, all of you gentlemen, to Rajya Sabha Television. And let me begin with you, Professor uh, Sharma. Let's start by uh, trying to understand the aim of having such a policy document and the key focus areas when we talk about science, technology, and innovation. Uh, indeed, uh, let me wish all the viewers a very purposeful and fulfilling new year. And I'm certain that the new science, technology and innovation policy uh, would be a part of it. Now, why do we need a new policy? Uh, you see, even 10 years ago, uh, the disruptive challenges of technology of the future, which is coming at us faster and faster, uh, were not clear. So 10 years ago, uh, people would not have paid attention uh, to things like sustainable development and the role of science and technology in it, the rise of intelligent machines, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. machine learning, industry 4.0, or society 5.0, uh, you know, a whole lot of challenges which are based on science and technology, climate change, environment, uh, resources, electric mobility, clean energy, and so on. At the same time, also uh, the whole concept of innovation and startups. Uh, and their role in building our economy through science and technology also was not very compelling. There were other issues, for example, related to diversity, inclusion, a seamless end-to-end -end science and technology ecosystem, which is inclusive, which is empowered, which is fully geared to meet our challenges of today and tomorrow, including the Atmanirbhar Bharat. Mm -hmm. So these, these were the issues that have become clear. Uh, in fact, even COVID-19, the, the times of COVID-19 within which the entire policy has taken shape, that itself has taught us many lessons, many compelling lessons, which have all been integrated. Okay. This uh, policy. Uh, so this is basically the background on which we started policy uh, and, and, mm -hmm. and basically saying, uh, you know, it's not so much about working in silos, but it's about uh, making connections, whether it is connection between industry, academia, R&D, uh, government, uh, startups, NGOs, the society at large. Mm -hmm. uh, so so th this is where we focus a okay. great deal in this particular policy. Okay. And then what are the key takeaways here, uh, uh, Professor Sharma, since you're talking about the focus areas and uh, the, the key, key takeaways, takeaways is, because, is, because uh, some, some, some of the points here, uh, you know, talk about one nation, one subscription and few others there as well. But uh, we would love to hear it from uh, you. Uh, certainly. So, okay, if you, if you mention uh, the one nation, one subscription, that is in fact part of a larger vision. The part that the vision basically is how do we democratize science? In other words, science is not only for scientists. Of course, scientists are the ones who create science, but they're also users of science uh, for planning, for development in every line ministry, in the state government, uh, in industry, everywhere. So, so how do we democratize uh, this information, data, knowledge related to science? Which means you must have access. All our citizens, all our organizations, institutions that work, that have anything to do with science, they must have total access uh, to mm -hmm. it. Uh, so right now, of course, the subscriptions are very fragmented. Uh, very few people, you know, on okay, resources. 
But it's not only that. You look at all the data and information that is uh, generated with the help of government, which is funded by the government. But the access to this data and information uh, is not there with the ease of access. So all of this must empower our development. Uh, we, we must reach out uh, everybody uh, from gram panchayat level to every citizen who would make use of this information and data. Uh, so it's about the ease of doing business. It's about mm -hmm. access to uh, data and information. And part of that is uh, what you about one nation. One, we, we can do a lot better uh, in, in that particular area. Okay. Um, and, and so, yes. Okay, okay, okay. We'll, we'll come to other other uh, specific aspects as well. And there are several, uh, you know, uh, takeaways and key focus areas. But let's also uh, hear it from our other two guests. Let me uh, bring in uh, uh, Professor Rao here first. Professor Rao, from your point of view, uh, you know, the need to have a new policy when we talk about science, technology, and innovation as well. As, uh, you know, Professor Sharma was pointing out, uh, there is an urgent need and the COVID pandemic period has also taught us a number of lessons. Thank you very much. I think, uh, you know, as Professor Shilma mentioned, uh, this is something which is needed now for the current times. But if you see in the country today, there is a lot of science happening, I think, uh, but all of that ends up as research publications. There is a lot of technology also getting generated, but that doesn't feed into innovation. Innovation is something where you apply this technology and produce something that is tangible for the society. So therefore, Right now, though, there is science happening, there is technology happening, there is innovation happening, but there is no proper flow between all of these different verticals. And that is the biggest challenge. Science enterprise research publications. Technology often is, you know, it comes from somewhere and then we tend to put it together and, you know, it's all low tech. That is what you see mostly, you know, what happens out of uh, uh, the Indian uh, industry or other things, which is coming out of the Indian science. And mm -hmm. the innovation also, you know, there is a lot of, a lot of innovation that is, that is taking place, but again, the deep tech innovation is also missing in the country. And what this policy basically is trying to do is uh, have a more cohesive kind of an approach. And how do you make research eventually lead to innovation? I think that is the transformation that is what is being attempted. And for that to happen, I think you know the, the, the unified approach is what is required, which is also what uh, the STI policy is advocating. And uh, I think uh, you know, one of the great things that the policy also talks about is involvement of ministries. You know, I think that is also very important because ministries uh, have lots of problems. You know, they are the ones who, who deal with uh, multiple issues uh, concerning their ministries, but many of them don't really support uh, institutions for research or innovation because mm -hmm. they don't even have a cohesive framework for supporting institutions today. And I think what this policy also talks about is it is now, uh, you know, saying that all ministries need to allocate, you know, some amount of their uh, money or some amount of their their funds for innovation kind of applications, and uh, and then they will engage with academia, they will engage with uh, with other stakeholders in the in the whole ecosystem, so that you know people tend to work on the right kind of problems and then you know deliver solutions. I think that is what is uh, what is happening. I think to me. The biggest takeaway from the from this policy is a cohesive framework mm -hmm. to science, technology, and innovation, one feeding to the other. I think that okay. is what uh, the most important aspect. I think the policy document is very well framed, and I think the credit should go to uh, Professor Ashutosh Sharma, Department of Science and Technology, and all the stakeholders. It has come out very well. Okay, okay. A cohesive framework there as far as science and technology is concerned. Uh, let me also bring in Dr. Ram Vishwakarma here. Uh, Dr. Vishwakarma, from your point of view, you know, the key takeaways uh, as far as this draft policy is concerned and the aim there to bring in these changes. So how would you look at all these aspects? So I look at it uh, stepping back from what is happening globally and what India needs to respond. Uh, Globally, the expectation of societies and governments have changed what they expected earlier from science and scientists. I think they have changed. And as you see globally, societies are expecting things which are very different than they were expecting, say, 30 years, 40 years. Uh -huh. So I think this whole knowledge enterprise has dramatically changed over the last 5 to 10 years globally. And uh, it is not 
uh, India alone, other other countries are going through same phases. So I think is an incumbent on the scientific community, people who administer science, to recognize that change. And I think this policy recognizes that change. For me, that is a big takeaway that there is a greater recognition of that. We have to change the way do we science because we have been very privileged in this country for the last 70 years that we have been virtually considered as an investment in future and questions were not asked in terms of the translational outcome, in terms of societal outcome. So I'm very happy to see one point here where it talks about basically the academic impact and societal impact. So uh -huh. I think interplay of this slowly, slowly with the greater demand from the stakeholders, taxpayers, governments, I think an industry also, because industry has to compete globally. And if local science is not able to provide them the basic science, which is globally competitive, our industry will fall behind. So I think these three or four aspects have been, these are the big big takeaway for me that they have been addressed in this. Now the question will remain that, you know, this policy implementation, you know, we practicing scientists for the last 20, 30 years and being director of the laboratory, I realized that, these policies, implementation, we need different framework also within scientific institution. I think those issues are also being addressed here to create that ecosystem. Yeah, so okay. I'm, I'm very pleased to see this, these things included here. Yeah. Okay, okay, definitely. Implementation is one very key important area there and we will come to that part also. But uh, I'll go back to uh, Professor Sharma here. Professor Sharma, uh, you know, in terms of takeaways, uh, while you were earlier pointing out few of them and uh, both Professor Rao and Dr. Vishwakarma have also, uh, you know, pointed out uh, key significant ones. There are one or two which I would like your comment upon. One is where it talks about accountable research ecosystem. That's one part, as, as in the aim there to go ahead and do, uh, uh, you know, achieve uh, uh, what I, what exactly are we trying to achieve there. Second is the STI Development Bank, you know, initiative like this uh, or a National STI Observatory. So what are these aimed at? Uh, see, uh, so, you know, as was pointed out by Professor Ram Gopal Rao and, and Dr. Ram, you see, it, it's all about connecting our silos and I'll come to in a moment just, just in 10 seconds to the, the question that you were asking. You see, uh, essentially what we have recognized very clearly that there are two parts uh, of one that creates knowledge mm -hmm. and one that consumes knowledge. So oftentimes in the past we have only been focused on things that create knowledge but actually our major weakness is not there. And this, in fact, has been shown by COVID-19 time that our major weakness is not in creation of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, the sum of the weaknesses are in terms of the direction and relevance of that knowledge mm -hmm. and its consumption, which means its connect uh, with industry, uh, mm -hmm. with the government, with the startups. So all of that has to bring in greater focus. Okay. Now. Um, the point that you talked about, this is about, again, about democratization of knowledge. Uh, so the repository that you talked about is about having all the data and information available on one platform uh, so, so that everybody can access that. At the same time, all the information which is in terms of patents and publications also must be easily accessible uh, to everybody. But the major... Uh, major idea uh, is uh, indeed related to the fact that we need to bring in more stakeholders very strongly supporting and using science and technology. Uh, so who are these stakeholders? See, these are state governments. So typically states have been tend to ignore uh, the value of science, technology and innovation for them, but they are all now waking up. So they want to partner in a strong way and they want, want to solve their local problems mm -hmm. using global science. Okay. So that is one stakeholder base. But the second one is industry. So industry, of course, while they do R&D on their own, uh, you know, the, again, the connection to, to a whole lot of infrastructure that we have, connection to the knowledge resources that we have, uh, connection to human resources that we have, uh, that has been a little bit weak. So now how do we bring them on board, both in terms of investing uh, in science and technology, but at the same time, connecting it with everything else that we have. So we must leverage all of that. So this is done both by fiscal and non-fiscal incentives, uh, but also uh, a public-private partnership roadmap, uh, which means that the nation needs certain technologies and products. 
Uh-huh. And if we can project it to the industry and develop it in co-partnership with them, then you know their understanding of market becomes clear from the beginning. Uh, so that together with the procurement policies of the government, which we already know now uh, are undergoing very uh, you know major changes. Okay. They undergone major changes. That was a very clear push to our industry uh, to invest in knowledge resources. And they can do that with the government. Uh, so, you know, so, so they, for example, I would conclude by saying, how, how do you do that? Uh-huh. You, you see all the in- scientific infrastructure, human resources, everything that we have. Now, industry does not have a very ease of access uh, to these resources. They don't have co-ownership of these resources. So it would be a win-win situation both for academia, R&D labs, and industry to, in fact, have an early direction uh, for the knowledge, uh, which would be consumed. Uh, and so there are, uh, you know, many uh, ideas and aspects related. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, now, this is about national priorities. It's about Atmanirbhar Bharat, which again has become something which is very clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, look. Uh, you know, Professor Ram Gopal, Rao, CSIR, everybody knows uh, that we could have made ventilators, we could have made uh, the top of the class diagnostics, we could have made everything even five, ten years ago. But we did not. Okay, the reason we did not and we could do it in the four months uh, COVID-19 period, the top of the line diagnostics coming from CSIR, for example, CRISPR-based diagnostics, you know, latest, cutting edge, right? Uh, and all of this happened. Why? It happened because there was a common purpose. There was an early direction. There was a co-ownership of everything that was being done by the society at large. Uh, so if we bring in the same energy and vision uh, and um, you know energy into this, I have no doubt uh, that everything that the nation needs uh, that we are totally dependent on, for example, mm-hmm. uh, for imports and so on, uh, that can start developing at a speed and scale, starting okay. now. Uh, and and within 10 years, uh, we should be, our vision of the policy is, in this decade, uh, we should be uh, within the top three countries in the world uh, in terms of everything we do in science, technology, and innovation. Not okay. just in terms of number of papers. Number of papers, we already three or four in the world, which simply means that we can produce knowledge. We can produce world-class knowledge. So now, obviously, the weakness is that how to use this knowledge. Okay. okay. Uh, and so this is what the policy is about. Okay. Indeed, it is all about, uh, you know, putting the knowledge back to work in terms of uh, the need where it is required and a cohesive approach, as uh, Professor Sharma is pointing out, co-ownership there as well. That brings me to both uh, Professor Rao and uh, Dr. Vishwakarma again. Professor Rao, I'll start with you in terms of... Uh, the implementation aspect, since you know you, you're, you're head of an institution there, which develops uh, or rather produces, uh, you know, not only technologies but also human resources, uh, who as a scientist, as uh, you know, can work upon those particular ideas and can bring forth uh, more interesting views as well. So policies like these, uh, when they put, when put into implementation mode, how best to do it? It's a good, important point. Uh, I should mention, you know, um, I think it has to be a bottom-up versus top-down kind of an approach. It's not actually versus uh, each other. It's a, it's a combination of top-down and bottom-up kind of an approach, which is the need of the hour right now. I will give you an example. You know, if you look at ISRO, right, mm-hmm. why do we consider ISRO as a successful organization in this country? There are so many labs, you know, they have a, a huge number of laboratories. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, all of their output must go towards flying a satellite. I think there is a very focused objective. You do whatever you want in these laboratories. At the end of the day, if ISRO is not able to fly those satellites, we would you know, not consider ISRO as successful. Common purpose. That's the reason why that common mission mode kind of an approach is where you know ISRO is seen as a very successful organization. Mm-hmm. You look at any agency in the country, wherever a, wherever a mission is set, Wherever common goals are set, India has done very well. Whether it is DRDO, whether it is ISRO, whether it is DAE, all of these organizations have done very well because it is a bottom-up plus a top-down kind of an approach. In academia, that is something that is lacking right now. 
everything is left to the researchers to decide the problems they decide the approach they decide what they want to do with the research they decide everything is left to these researchers as a result you know there is a lot of research happening but all of that is not adding up to something which you can show as a tangible output like what isro is able to demonstrate you know mm-hmm. i would like what professor sharma is mentioning the covid time you know at iit delhi we said that during the covid time we all will focus as an institution on just the covid because there was nothing else that made sense to you know undertake as a research in these times once an institution now put the focus on covid uh, you know finding solutions to the covid problem you know in about like what professor sharma mentioned in 5 to 6 months time we had the world's uh, cheapest uh, rt pcr kit we supplied 5 million ppes now at the most affordable kind of a price almost 40% of them are getting exported and then you know we were able to study the medicines uh, you know in a scientific way the traditional medicines in a scientific way publish papers in the world's top journals which are also now you know as an information which is available for the people as you can see one single institute having focus as covid people coming together as a multidisciplinary kind of teams i think mm-hmm. you know able to deliver so much in in a, in a matter of 6 months kind of a time i think that is what is needed to be done during the normal times too in the normal times if there is that urgency built if there is that focus that is brought to our institutions with the kind of support that has happened you know during this covid time even the approval processes in the government you know all got streamlined in a matter of months because there was that urgency as a result we all of our our institutions were able to deliver so much in such a short period of time i think okay. you know this is this is a le- lesson to learn from the covid and i think this is what that must apply during even during the normal times if we are able to do that there is so much of potential in our academia i think if we can tap even a small percentage of it india will be a developed country pretty soon okay indeed uh, there is no dearth of potential uh, and knowledge as far as india is concerned uh, uh, that uh, brings me to dr vishwakarma for the concluding comments dr vishwakarma uh, from uh, from your perspective you earlier spoke about also the implementation part so what's the best way to move forward because if you look at the policy document it indeed looks like a landmark one yeah so i am sure when a policy like this has been set up and i'm sure lot of lot of sort of discourse has gone behind it so if policy has been set up i'm sure uh, the the pathway to implement it and i think we all know how to implement it. it's not that something that we have to reinvent that that knowledge is there in fact we have to just come out of that comfort zone like moving from phase 1 to phase 2 to phase 3 and i think india has to move graduate to occupy the kind of space like india in basic sciences sit on the global high table today Uh-huh. which was not uh, in research 30 years ago we did that and we decided to do that now if we decide to do that that in the translational domain translation of our knowledge which we create other people leverage that knowledge i think we have to also leverage part of that knowledge and i must point out here which is the disconnect in india i think this policy is looking at it and i i request dr sharma to look at this that you know the r and d that happens in our national laboratories and universities and iits and r&d that happened in indian r&d uh, r&d companies indian companies the there is a significant overlap uh-huh. according to me in in a, in a very advanced science driven economy the r&d that happen in public system which should be the one which industry should be doing 20 years from now so i think that connect and strategy to decide that how do we divide what my my r&d company pharma company in bombay should not be doing what i am doing in csir i should be creating that knowledge and moving into areas where actually we have opportunity to become global leader areas of materials uh-huh. the biological revolution that is right now happening globally i think going to change the face of medicine and everything else that is happening in for example regenerative medicine translational medicine that is happening so i think the this policy document i was reading it and i i got nice to see that many time i could see this component of synergy translation and i think if a discussion that happens with industry and we can divide the domain and i, I it's, it cannot be watertight obviously but there is a, there is a proactive approach which department can take ministry can take to support funding and i make i also want to say before before i conclude uh-huh. that time has come when the taxpayer funding should also go to private r&d it's ultimately the science that thrives there science drive there i think this 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 notion we have to shed now in this nation like you know look at the covid time 
how much United States government has funded through BADA program. Most of the, you know, Moderna vaccine is $900 million funded by U.S. government. And mm-hmm. I think that that across scientists in private industry or scientists in IIT or CSI, DST lab, after all, he is a scientist. And we should support science scientists to do innovation. I will. I, I see this policy is hinting towards that. And I think hopefully we are moving in that direction. Okay, okay, definitely. Those are very, very important, significant suggestions. Dr. Vishwakarma, thank you so much there. And Professor Ashutosh Sharma as well. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us uh, on Rajya Sabha Television and uh, briefing us on uh, the takeaways uh, or the important points on this policy. Also, I would like to thank uh, Professor Rao as well for his uh, valuable inputs and comments there as on the National Science, Technology and Innovation Policy Draft, which has now been put into public domain by the Department of Science and Technology. And everyone is invited to go ahead and give in their suggestions or comments till 25th of January. You can log on to the DST's website and follow the process there. These were the aspects as far as uh, this particular draft policy is concerned. The idea is to have a cohesive approach, ensure co-ownership and also ensure that translation benefits of uh, the work done in the research and development areas as far as science and technology is concerned uh, are given to the society in terms of benefits. We'll come back again with a different topic. Till then, keep watching Rajasabha Television.